sometimes I do episodes and there's no immediate reason why the topic I'm discussing is in current politics. And I've really come to figure after doing this for 15 years, it'll be 15 years in July, that, you know, eventually the world is going to get there. Our political world will get there. And, it, and so in 2014, I did a topic on the lowly subject at that time of vaccines, a little bit of discussion about anti-vax, a little bit of discussion about the measles vaccine and forcing kids in school to get it. But it really was just a topic of interest. And now we're all talking about vaccines. So this episode's from 2014. It's been a while since it's aired. I think most people haven't heard it. But if you have, there'll be a new one coming out soon. But I do want you to picture a scenario for a moment. So you go out with your children. It's a bright, sunny day. And you're a person of means that actually has access to your own private island up in Canada. And it's a small island, but it has a lovely water surrounding, and you're frolicking in the water. It's a warm day, you're playing with the kids. You make a fire. You you put out the fire, and you go home, and just about to eat dinner when you just feel extremely tired, and so tired that you tell your wife and the kids, I'm just going to go upstairs and take a nap. You walk up the stairs, you go to bed, sleep. A nap turns into a full sleep. You wake up the next morning and simply are unable to move your legs to get out of bed yourself. You call for help. Family helps. You're able to move your arms. Everything's sort of okay. And you hope that maybe later in the day this will be gone, and it's not. And you hope that maybe by the end of the week this will be gone, it's not. And this is very distressing because you are a person of significance. You are the person who just was your party's nominee for the vice presidency of the United States in the last election and has a bright political career ahead of you. And really, your legs will never get better. And although doctors tell you what it is, it's not even clear to this day what it is. That's exactly what happened to Franklin Roosevelt. We can do a series of what-ifs. Obviously, Franklin Roosevelt's political career was bright after that. It didn't seem that way at the time, certainly. And whether or not the very challenge he was stuck with helped him to be politically tenacious, or whether that was a fluke, whether he might have been able to be a submarine candidate because of it, or if that was just a fluke, we don't know. What we do know, though, is Franklin Roosevelt would spend the rest of his life fighting for a vaccine. F.D. Roosevelt, former Assistant Secretary of the Navy and Democratic candidate for Vice President, was brought to the city from Camp Babello Island, Bay of Fundy yesterday, suffering from poliomyelitis, which for more than a month has caused the loss of the use of both of his legs below the knees. Mr. Roosevelt's removal to Presbyterian Hospital, it was said, from his home at 47 East 65th Street, was to enable him to have special treatment, which could hasten the return of the control of his legs. The attack was very mild and Mr. Roosevelt would not be permanently crippled. His general condition, it was said, was better than at any time in years. Fall 1775, Boston. It's a city occupied, as Americans would say now, occupied 
by British soldiers. They'd come to put down the trouble and rebellion in Boston. But their forays outside of Boston to try to control the arms supplies of the colonists led to defeat at Concord. So the British stayed in the city for the time, and they were then surrounded by an American army. George Washington is sent by the Continental Congress to lead the army. The city was bottled up, and it suffered from something that was common in cities in America and Europe. A smallpox epidemic. Thus, George Washington, general, has to deal with a threat that many generals have had to deal with. And it's a threat that could potentially harm more soldiers and British guns. And it was one that he had dealt with before. As a young man, 19, in Barbados in 1751, he developed smallpox. It hurt him. It immobilized him. But it never threatened him seriously. He was left with slight scars. But now this smallpox might immobilize his army. Reports even surfaced that the British were sending the people infected out of the city to expand the epidemic into the American lines. In response, Washington forbids refugees from Boston to come anywhere near the American camp in order to avoid the risk of exposure. He knows what he's dealing with. He describes in 1777 smallpox as a potentially greater threat than the sword of the enemy. He writes to the President of the Continental Congress to assure him that he had been particularly attentive to the least symptoms of the smallpox, quarantining anyone suspected of having the disease in a special hospital in the camp. He also promised that he would continue the utmost vigilance against this most dangerous foe. Smallpox was typically brought to 18th century America by either English immigrants or newly arrived slaves. In Europe, People were generally immune. There were still outbreaks. The majority of the American population led isolated lives on farms and plantations. And if you weren't in one of the coastal cities, Boston, Philadelphia, and Charleston, there was little chance of acquiring the disease or building any immunity. There were no smallpox epidemics in the colony of Virginia prior to 1747. In fact, very few Virginians were exposed to smallpox prior to the American Revolution. Well, now, Washington building the first continental American army has a problem because he's bringing all of these new allies together. Soldiers who hadn't left their farms. But they also had no immunity. So Washington does something interesting. He institutes a system where new recruits would be inoculated with the smallpox virus immediately upon their enlistment. And they're going to get that inoculation before they leave Virginia and come up to Massachusetts. Now, how do they do this? Because there are no vaccines at this time. That is true. It's kind of an ugly way to do it. What you're actually going to do is take some of the pus from an infected person and spread that deep into a wound of another, all right? You're actually going to cut a person in order to get the virus in. And yes, soldiers would then contract a milder form of smallpox while they're being outfitted with uniforms and weapons. So hopefully, they would be healed, inoculated, and supplied by the time they leave to join the army and join the fight. This is not a precision technique, and some soldiers are greatly harmed during this process. It was before routine vaccination, the technique was known. Despite Washington's steps, the disease was never fully under control. May have changed the outcome of the war on both sides. I mean, epidemics broke out in Boston and Philadelphia in the summer of 1776, and the retreat of an American force sent to take Quebec was blamed on a number of factors. And one of them was the high prevalence of smallpox among the soldiers. Here's what the uh, historian and philosopher Michel Foucault says about smallpox. I, I would like to take the example of the epidemic and smallpox in particular. It was definitely the most widely endemic disease of its time. Every newborn child has about a two in three chance of getting it. As a general rule, for the whole population, the mortality rate was smallpox, 
the mortality rate for smallpox was a 1.77, almost 1 in 8. Secondly, it was a phenomenon that also had the feature of sudden, very strong, and intense epidemic outbursts in London in particular at the end of the 17th and start of the 18th century. There were very intense epidemic outbursts in intervals of rarely more than five or six years. Clergy are prominent from the founding of the colonies we know now as the United States of America through to the revolution and into the early debates between the Federalists and the Republicans and into American history. Most prominent among the clergy in early America would be Cotton Mather. The New Englanders are a people of God, settled in those which were once by right the wonders of the Christian religion. may be easily from the deprivations of Europe exceedingly to the American strand. When the the heavy curse of God will fall upon those children that make light of their parents, required therein by him. Whatever enjoyments are by God conferred upon us, where lies the relish, where the sweetness of them? His father's increase, Mather, very important in the Massachusetts colony in fact, has a hand in the government because he's going to be one of the people who are going to have the governor of that Massachusetts colony arrested and sent back to England. And he becomes a bulwark of the independence of the Massachusetts colony. It's going to provide an important precedent for the American Revolution. Cotton Mather goes to Harvard. He becomes assistant preacher for his father, then gets his own church. And if you're in Boston at this time, a lot of what you read and what you hear is going to be authored by Mather because he writes something like 300 or 400 books, not just on religion, but most of them having a religious bent, little prayer books, some of them, books just about how to be a good person. One of them is going to reach the hands of a young Ben Franklin, who's working for his brother at this time in the newspaper. It's going to be of great influence to him. And he's going to relate some of the same tales in Mather's books in his Poor Richard's Almanac. Mather will write a giant opus, his big work, Magna Christi Americanus, which is going to talk about the settlement of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the story of the pilgrims, up into the time that he's writing, which is the turn of the century, early 1700s. There wasn't a separation of church and state. The two were very connected in the Massachusetts colony. And during the famous Salem witch trials, Mather's going to play a role. At first, he's an advocate for the use of spectral evidence, the idea that someone could be proven a witch by supernatural events, that that the court should consider it. Later, when his role is criticized in the witch trials, and he's very involved in egging them on, He's going to recant some of this or try to reduce his role in advocating the use of spectral evidence. One of the things that's going to happen to Ben Franklin is he's going to run away from his brother, James Franklin, and go to Philadelphia and start a life there, become an important printer. This is slightly a violation of law because Ben Franklin, while he's not a slave per se, he is an indentured servant to his brother and owes his brother by the laws of that time, he, in a sense, runs out on him. When he comes back from Philadelphia, one of the people he's going to visit is Cotton Mather. And there's a story where Cotton Mather brings him into the house. They talk for a little bit. And as he's leaving, Mather says uh, to Ben Franklin, Stoop! Stoop! Franklin didn't quite hear him. Bam! Hits his head on the door jam. This is where Mather intones. You are young, and you have the world before you. Stoop as you go through it. Franklin would recount later, I often think of Mather's word when I see pride mortified and the misfortunes brought upon people by carrying their heads too high. Mather influenced Franklin in others' ways because he was a believer in science. He wrote about the theories of Sir Isaac Newton. He wrote about how plants would grow and spread. But there's another modern controversy that he got himself involved with. 
The early American colonies are getting hit with a lot of diseases. You know, ships are coming, arriving, bringing what we now know are new microbes to the people of Boston. They had no idea at the time. They suspected it might be some bad air or bad food or, or evil spirits, all of these things. Smallpox hits quite often. And Cotton Mather is very interested in reading the medical journals, particularly that of the Royal Society of London, and also in contributing to them, because he wants to show that Boston is a significant part of the British Empire and can contribute to the knowledge of people within the empire. It's about 1706 when his church decides that in order to reward him, that they'll provide him with a slave. Mather names him Onesimus. Now, yes, there are slaves. There are also free blacks in the Massachusetts colony at this time. Slavery is legal in the Massachusetts all the way up to the time of the American Revolution. I mean, it might work a little different in Massachusetts than it may in the South, uh, but the terms of the deal are the same. Onesimus was not free to go. But Mather does a few things that might separate him from others. He teaches Onesimus how to read and write. And he converts him to Christianity. I mean, that's part of the reason of teaching him how to read and write so that he can read the Bible. And the most important reason we know about Onesimus is from Mather's own diary. And in 1716 or so, he has a conversation with him about the smallpox. And Onesimus tells him that in Africa, it's very common to take a thorn and then take some of the pus from an infected person and injure yourself and put the pus into your own wound. And when you do that, you'll be inoculated from the smallpox. You won't get it again. There's a question as to whether this is the first that Mather's heard of it, or if it's just confirming things that he's heard in other places, in medical journals and the like. But he confirms it by talking to other Africans, free and slave, who are in Boston and find that many of them have a scar because of this practice. By the time Boston gets hit with another smallpox epidemic, early 1720s, Mather has already released Onesimus. See, we don't know a lot about Onesimus, but apparently by earning money somehow, perhaps doing other work for other people, he bought his own freedom. But when the smallpox epidemic once again hits Boston, Mather remembers his conversation with Onesimus, and he has his own son inoculated. He also brings a Dr. Boylston into the process. He's a supporter. He has his own son inoculated as well. But they want to do more than that. See, Mather is an influencer. If he's behind inoculation, he's going to get others. So he writes a journal article and an advertisement in the New England Current. This is the paper of James Franklin, brother of Ben. Ben's working for the paper at this time, talking about the miracle of inoculation and how it's worked for them. He also goes before the town supervisors and wishes to have the process of inoculation set as the policy of the colony. Well, this starts a month-long debate, including a series of nasty letters in the New England Current. August 14th, 1721, New England Current. This advertisement ought to supersede the fable of the fox, who by misadventure, losing his tail, advises his fellow citizens to part with their tails. And there's even some satire from the Franklin brothers, and attacks from them while they're running the paper on the position of Dr. Boylston and Cotton Mather. The debate is so intense going back and forth Doctors are attacking the reverend for using quack medicine. At one point, a bomb is thrown into Mather's house. So this is a pretty intense debate of the vaxxers and anti-vaxxers of their day. And I mean, you can kind of see it because the last thing you would think of is of giving a healthy person a disease in order to prevent them from it. You know, now we know the scientific basis for it. But they had no idea at that time. It just seemed like some kind of magic. And so it fell to someone who was a religious authority, although had an interest in science, who had faith enough to use it rather than a person who was a scientist and could prove it, which it couldn't be proved. And it wouldn't be proved for another two centuries almost. But the influence of 
people who were held in slavery on modern medicine is not limited to just Onesimus. James Potter Collins is a white Revolutionary War veteran in South Carolina. He becomes ill in October 1802, and no one's quite sure what his illness is. He consults with a series of regular physicians, and they're all unsuccessful. Finally, the last physician who sees them says, he's a younger person. He says, look, have you ever tried African poison or tricking, as he called it? Collins replies, yeah, I have heard of it, but I'm not a believer. Doctor explains, like, look, you know, we medical men reject the doctrine as an absurdity, and it's against our interest to admit it, but a man may be convinced against his own judgment. We have had three cases, exactly the same as yours, failed in them all, and two of the men got perfectly cured, very simply, by applying to an old African and are now both well and hearty men. So Collins decides to take the doctor's advice, describes this whole thing in his autobiography, and he doesn't even know how to describe it because he's doing something that's so weird for his time, but it's just because of his illness. He says, I I began to consult with this oracle, ephod, or whatever name you might choose to give it, for I have none. I felt a little sullen, thinking it would turn out to be mere balderdash. He told, I told him of the the complaint, and he told me if I would stay some 10 or 12 days, he would cure me. Colin's still skeptical. I complied literally with the instructions of this magician or whatever it might be termed, and however strange it may appear to others, I was entirely cured. Slaves brought with them medical practices from Africa, and they were healing people in the Americas. You had slaves who were experts in herbal medicine. And that knowledge did enter the entire society. So using gems and weed for rheumatism, chestnut leaf for asthma, boiling a teacup of logwood chips, using sassafras root kind of as a general blood cleaner, snake root, mayapple, red pepper, pine needles, red oak bark, wintergreen tea, garlic, catnip. Slave healers would make plasters of mustard. So you take some mustard powder, a little water, spread it on a cloth, and put it on the person's chest. Not too long. It's going to be just a few minutes, or else it's going to burn. And that's going to help draw blood to the surface and decrease congestion when they have it. Their cure for pneumonia. Physician resources in America are limited. So slave owners would have slaves designated to treat the other slaves when they got sick, and they had a certain level of control over their care. That varied from place to place, and the temperament of the owner, of course. There were some that didn't believe in any of this. Others did. And we know a lot of this from the WPA interviews in the 30s that were conducted of people who were very old but had been slaves. Joe Hawkins, a former slave, had told his WPA interviewer that doctors didn't treat a person like they do now. They'd bleed you so many minutes while they watched a big watch that they always carried. They bled you for almost any sickness, even against smallpox. Another former slave, uh, Sylvia King, remembered. There weren't many doctors in them times, but there was a closet full of simples, home remedies. And almost all the women, white or black, could go to the woods to get their medicine. Wes Brady, another slave in Texas, told his WPA interviewer, that the white doctor who was hired to care for the slaves on the plantation where he lived would help the slaves because he didn't want to introduce the traditional medicine treatments. That doctor informed the master that a slave was pretty sick. Sometimes they stay in bed three or four days taking flower pills, he said. This was to allow the herbal medicines, which he felt were better anyway, to heal. There are articles that appear in the medical journals throughout the 1800s, not many of them, but a few, where the evidence that Virginia doctors are citing are in the the use of the medicine among their slaves. You have a Dr. R.S. Bailey in 1856 addresses the South Carolina Medical Association, You have uh, where he's addressing particular remedies as being from an African-American origin. 1850, South Carolina physician Dr. Edward Mitchell writes an article for the Charleston Medical Journal and Review talking about Black Root Mitchell. 
and its role in curing disease. Also, valuable medicinal plants known as yet only to some of our black population. Now, we also know that in 1825, a slave, Jane Minor of Petersburg, was emancipated for her healing ability. She has her own freedom granted, and she earns enough money to free 16 other slaves. 1749, in South Carolina, the legislature frees a slave named Caesar and pays him 100 pounds per year for his life for revealing his cure for poisons and rattlesnake bites. Here's another one. 1729, a slave named Papin is referred to in the Virginia Council Journal as a doctor who was freed for revealing his cures, ordered to remain under the direction of the government until he make a discovery of some other secrets he has for expelling poison and the cure of other diseases. Smallpox is one of the earliest disease and a killer, a highly contagious disease. You have in Britain, Liddy Mary Montague and her husband he is the British ambassador to Turkey. And Montague is like any mother today, right? Is concerned about her child's health. Now, Turkey is ruled at this time by the Ottoman Empire. They're under Islamic law. Women are segregated from men. She spends her time in these segregated areas with the women. She talks to them. She learns of a practice that they, most of them, put their children through of what is called varialization. It's not a vaccination exactly, because what you do is you take an infection actually from the injury of a person infected with the disease and and place that into the blood of a person who does not have the disease with the hopes of giving them immunity. She sees them doing this. They're taking, a, a patient has smallpox. They're taking material from the blister, putting it into like a nutshell, and then giving it to another person. It's the strangest thing, and not something that exists at all in Western medicine. Foucault is going to talk about many, many years later, is that it was integrated within the fields of acceptable medical rationality, but it had no basis in it. I mean, what's remarkable, Foucault says, about varialization is that it did not try to prevent smallpox so much as provoke it in inoculated individuals. The practice of vaccination and varialization were unthinkable in terms of the medical rationality at the time. It was a mere matter of fact, and that remained the case until the late 19th century with Louis Pasteur and a rational explanation as to why it would work. It's a change, Foucault says, in the previous practice of seeking to purely nullify a disease, prevent contact between the sick and the healthy, as you might do in, say, leprosy. This practice is something completely different from modern medicine at the time. It's give a small amount of the disease to everyone, healthy and sick. As one medical writer at the time, before the germ theory of disease and immunology is, is proven, the best he can say with vaccines is that experience alone proves its veracity. In any case, back to Montague. So she doesn't just do this in Turkey. She comes home writes an anonymous article about this practice, promotes the procedure. She starts encountering a great deal of resistance, of course, especially from the medical establishment, because this is an Oriental, Eastern tradition. But in 1721, there's a smallpox epidemic in England. She has her three-year-old daughter, who was born after the visit to Turkey, inoculated by a British physician who had been at the embassy there in Turkey, knew how to do it, and publicized, and they publicized this event. Now, Montague also has influence with the royal family, and she persuades Princess Caroline to test the treatment. Well, the first thing they do, they take seven prisoners who are waiting execution, and they say, look, you can undergo this instead of the execution. If you live, you get to be released. Your service is done. All of them live. Then they go further. They take six orphan children and inoculate them with smallpox. And they all survive. 
Now you have some royal attention. This is uh, quite a procedure. 1722, King George, this is the grandfather of George III, allows Montague's doctor to inoculate two of his grandchildren, the children of the princess. These children recover from smallpox. So, you know, they, they, they take the, they take the procedure and they recover. Stunning successes, but it's not perfect. In one household, there are six servants who become ill with smallpox after a child in the house is inoculated. So they, while the child's okay, the servants get it from them. And some clergymen announced that trying to prevent the illness of smallpox was against God's will. And physicians warned that inoculation might actually spread the disease more. But inoculation becomes, in this period in the Western world, and especially in Britain, which is going to have the largest effect on, on American history, inoculation becomes the known way to prevent small, smallpox. And that's why what George Washington does in that battle of Boston is not all that crazy in terms of the thinking of the time. Part of this is that the technology wasn't that good, and, 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 and at this time, a live virus did carry a risk of infection. About 3% of those inoculated developed smallpox and died. Others would spend weeks recovering, but it was usually preferable to catching smallpox in the wild, where the mortality rate was 20 to 40%, and survivors were scarred and sometimes blind. It's 1754 when Lady Mary Montague is praised in Britain generally for bringing the smallpox virilization to the Western world. But it's in 1875 when Louis Pasteur makes discovery of the germ theory of disease. There's also Edward Jenner who deserves credit for his groundwork in vaccinology and immunology. His papers are established in the medical community. Pasteur replaces this person-to-person -person vaccination, which is not optimal, with a safer method and just growing organisms in pure culture sorely for the production of vaccines. It's in the 1890s when in the United States you get the first vaccines in regular distribution. One of the first ones is plague vaccine. Plague is a killer in the tenements and cities of America. There's an anti-plague horse serum. Cholera, typhoid vaccines are developed at this time. Diphtheria in the teens and 20s, you see the introduction of a good number of vaccines. Tetanus, rabies, typhoid, whooping cough, diphtheria, BCG. Flu comes out, and this is all great. And then there's a threat that the nation's not prepared for after World War I. The soldiers, again, fighting a war for America together from parts of the country, leaving some of them still, even at this, even, even 100 years later, leaving their farms for the first time on the boats back in the camps in Europe, they developed the Spanish flu. It's a huge epidemic in the United States, probably the topic of a whole podcast in and of itself. So there's a lot of attention during the teens and 20s on public health. So in 1901, in St. Louis, 13 children die, not of diphtheria, but of the diphtheria antitoxin. And nine children in Camden, New Jersey, die from tainted smallpox vaccine. The Biologics Control Act is enacted, includes the regulation of vaccine and antitoxin producers, requires licensing and inspectors of manufacturers. This is the beginnings of public health in the United States, and it's because there are some issues with the early vaccines and there's some poisonings. 1906, Pure Food and Drugs Act is formed, prohibiting interstate commerce in misbranded or adulterated food, drinks, drugs. That includes vaccines. That leads to the passage of the Biological Control Act of 1902. There isn't total compliance with vaccination. Uh, something seems wrong about it to at least a group. You have anti-compulsory vaccination associations forming. You have a fellow named Henning Jacobson, a Swedish immigrant to the United States and a minister who lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Massachusetts requires vaccination. Jacobson refuses 
it goes to court. Now, the context here is that there's a huge outbreak of smallpox in Boston. 1,596 cases, 270 deaths between 1901 and 1903. You got the smallpox a debate. And there's people on both sides. Anti-vaccinationists launched a scathing attack that compulsory vaccination is the greatest crime of our age. It slaughters tens of thousands of innocent children. It is more important than the slavery question because it is dehabilitating the whole human race. Now, Jacobson refuses to comply with his town's order for all adults to be vaccinated. He claimed a vaccine in the past had made him seriously ill as a child, and it made his son and others sick as well. He's ordered to pay a $5 fine. In 1902, it's about 143 bucks straight CPI calculation. It's probably actually more. He refuses to pay it. And the Massachusetts courts reject his argument that the compulsory inoculation violated the U.S. Constitution. Massachusetts, just one of 11 states at the time that required vaccination. It goes to the Supreme Court. And in a decision, Jacobson v. Massachusetts, Justice John Marshall Harlan decides. Now, often Harlan is in the minority especially in two famous cases we know about, Plessy v. Ferguson, about racial segregation, and Lochner v. New York, about the federal versus state power and the Commerce Clause. This time he's in the majority. He rejects Henning Jacobson's claim that the 14th Amendment gave him the right to refuse vaccination. Harlan deemed that the Massachusetts state punishment of a fine or imprisonment on those who refused vaccines was acceptable. So Jacobson has to pay the fine. Now, there is a limit that he applies, and he's that he does say Massachusetts cannot stick a needle into Jacobson without his permission, but they can find him. The end of the decision, Judge Harlan acknowledges that for certain individuals, requirement of vaccines could be cruel and inhuman if it's there's some kind of medical condition, so you can't do that. Could be an overreach of government power. But If you're a fit candidate for the vaccine, as Jacobson was, you can't refuse. And police power can be used. Jacobson v. Massachusetts sets up public health in the United States and the ability of the government to enforce public health. But it also shows something, because remember that in the same year, Harlan's going to be on the other side of Lochner v. New York, where the court says government cannot regulate working conditions under the claim of uh, state power. And the court's going to weigh down pretty heavily on laws about child labor. But they allow the police power for health. There's a deference towards public health decision-making. Supreme Court actually reaffirms this decision in Jacob in, uh, of Jacobson in Zutt v. King in 1922, which held that a school system could refuse admission to a student who failed to receive a required vaccination. In 1924, the New York Times lists potential candidates for New York state government. And it's here where they mention a name not often thought of lately. There's some speculation, the paper says, that F.D. Roosevelt may run. But this is unlikely because of his health. Roosevelt's not quiet during this period, the early 1920s. He doesn't act like a cripple. Eleanor Roosevelt goes out and takes the stump for him. This is after the 1920 election. Women have voted nationally in the first presidential election. And the Democratic Party is looking for speakers who are female to speak to women's clubs and various events. So Mrs. F.D. Roosevelt or Mrs. Franklin Roosevelt should be announced at these things. He's out there speaking, very active in New York state politics. By the time you get to 1924, Al Smith 
governor of New York, is going to run for president, asks for Franklin Roosevelt to give his nominating speech. Now, it's not only that Smith and Roosevelt are at this time friends. In fact, they've gone back and forth on that front. Franklin Roosevelt has been the vice presidential candidate of his party in 1920, so he has a national profile. And the party in a convention just four years ago had chosen him, at least for the vice presidential ticket. So he makes a speech, and this is his first major public address after the polio. He does more. He's handicapped as an individual, but he refuses to be handicapped politically. His own cousin, Theodore Roosevelt, this would be uh, Roosevelt's, this would be T.R.'s son, Theodore Roosevelt, is running for governor of New York, salutes his service as a veteran, but calls him a wretched public servant. That's his cousin. He also criticizes his performance, Theodore Roosevelt's, at the as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, in contrasting with his own, because Roosevelt had gotten involved in the Teapot Dome scandal where Navy oil lands were sold for some profit to Republican donors. Coolidge is running for election in his own right at this time, 24. Franklin Roosevelt calls Coolidge a mouse president and says, we need a man president. I mean, that's a bold statement when you consider that FDR has paralysis at this point. And he doesn't consider himself dehabilitated at all. And he's not just doing that kind of happy warrior smiling in politics. He's also doing the attack dog stuff. 1926, New York Times keeps reporting, F.D. Roosevelt goes south. He is still using crutches, but recovering from his attack. Now, down in Georgia, Roosevelt has a Model T converted so that he can drive it And he uses his car to ride around the rural countryside, visiting all sorts of people. He's exposed now to a side of American life that he wasn't really familiar with as a wealthy person in New York. He's gregarious. He talks to local farmers, to blue-collar workers in Georgia. He learns about the effects that droughts, falling crop prices have on people's lives. But it turns out that Warm Springs is having some financial issues, the resort there, so he's the favorite visitor. He can't allow the facility to close down, puts down $200,000 of his own money, transforms it into a rehabilitation center for polio patients like himself. Warm Springs Foundation is founded, and he starts raising money. Not just helping polio patients, though, and he's not just helping Georgia. He's actually helping F.D. Roosevelt as well. Roosevelt is doing something very interesting. As a prominent landowner in Georgia, a prominent visitor to the state, who also has a national profile, he is going to actually build some support there. Now, there's some speculation within the Democratic Party that Georgians are going to nominate him for president in 1928. No, he tells the paper, he's an Al Smith man. He's going to stand by him. It's suggested that there are some people in Georgia and the South who are what are called bitter enders. And the fight in 1924 over the nomination was too intense. And they won't nominate Smith under any circumstances. And that the Georgians might nominate Franklin Roosevelt as a compromise candidate. Roosevelt bats down any suggestion. But he does visit the South, and he calls for an extraordinary session of Congress for flood relief. And in 1928, he once again nominates Al Smith for president. Then he goes on the attack, this time of Hoover. Here's what he says. Knowing him, I am frankly skeptical. 
Mr. Hoover has a great facility in gaining the loyalty of those who serve under him, but I cannot help wondering if Mr. Hoover has the same ability to work with those who are his equals. He's a forceful politician, and he runs for governor of New York State in Al Smith's stead and wins. This is going to put him into a conflict with Al Smith. Eventually, he's going to get the nomination of 1932 over Al Smith and several others. When he becomes president, his Warm Springs Foundation down in Georgia is of high prominence. There's donations. And eventually, you get started the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. It's a nonpartisan association, health sciences, volunteers, trying to find research for treatments to polio and perhaps a vaccine and also to pay for treatment because the polio victims are poor in many cases. He he gets some of his Hollywood friends to raise money, gets one of his friends from Broadway, Eddie Cantor, the famous singer, to raise money. There's a newsreel show that's on that would have been just as familiar than as say 60 Minutes is today, and it's called The March of Time. And you go to the movie theater and you'd watch a little bit of, of news before the movie. The March of Time. So he asks everyone to send in a dime. They call it the March of Dimes. During the first appeal in 1938, the White House is flooded with 2,680,000 dimes and thousands more dollars in donations. You have the first attempts in 1935 to develop a vaccine. This is done using virus found in the spines of monkeys, crushed up, killed with formaldehyde. This vaccine doesn't work, and it doesn't kill children, but it gives them some allergic reactions and doesn't give them any immunity to polio. You have other attempts. What about perhaps a immunity treatment where you could give the antigens for polio to a patient? So they start trying this. And in some cases, this works, but just for a few months, and the treatment is very expensive. The cost of polio rehabilitation was often more than the average family could afford, and more than 80% of the nation's polio patients would receive funding from the March of Dimes. Some families also re- received support through the Shriners Hospitals for Children, originally called the Ancient Arabic Order of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, a fraternity we know as the Shriners, and they set up the Shriners Hospital for Children. There's probably not a more horrible image we can think of than the giant tubes, iron tubes that look almost something like a tiny oil tanker, except that we can see a child in it. One would see their their head sticking out of it, and they're alive uh, with the aid of this tanker. There's a photo of a room where patients are just lined up in these things. Some patients would have to stay in these machines called iron lungs just for a day or a few days, a few weeks. Others entered the machine and would never leave their entire adult life. Short moments, they could be brought out of the machine and bagged is what they would call it uh, manually by hospital staff. This was also done in poor areas where there was no such machine. Yet, As horrible as it was, when this machine, the iron lung, was invented, it was considered a miracle of modern medical technology. It wasn't, for instance, available for much of the 1920s. The first iron lung was invented in 1928, powered by an electric motor, and then outside of it were two vacuum machines. The original one really using the same technology as vacuum cleaners, and what happens is the vacuum would change the pressure inside the tank and when the pressure is lowered the chest cavity expands trying to fill this partial vacuum no assistance from the patient's muscles are needed 
When the pressure is raised, the chest cavity contracts. The expansion and contraction mimics the physiology of normal breathing. Expensive, though. An iron lung cost about $1,500. And in those times, it was about the same price as an average home. Plus, you had to run the machine. Patients were in the metal chambers for months, years, sometimes for life. Fertility rate could still be high. I mean, there were improvements funded by the March and Dimes and others. You had more positive pressure ventilators. They, of course, got those vacuum to be inside the machine instead of out. Positive pressure ventilators. That, that's one of the relics that we no longer see. But if we went back to a relatively modern time, we would see. You'd also see the quarantine. Cardboard plockers that would be placed in the windows of residences where patients were quarantined due to polio. In New York in 1909, if you violated a quarantine order, remove the placard. It could be punished by a fine up to $100. Polio is a bit of a mystery and a counter to that common linear view of history, right? That things just get better all the time and we just keep fighting uh, diseases and, uh, you know, and life is better as we move on. It exists in history. I mean, there are some references in ancient times. There's written references in Western literature back to the 1500s, but it's a rare disease. There are even some American outbreaks, but not that money. There's one in 1840. They're scattered throughout history. In the United States, strong cases to speak of start in the 1880s. Moving forward, there's a huge epidemic in Boston, then Vermont, New York City in 1916, an epidemic flares up. Centered in Brooklyn, infections tend to surface in the summer months. It's known the children are out, they're playing, they're in pools. 27,000 people come down with polio. More than 2,000 would die in New York City alone. Across the United States, 6,000 would die, leaving thousands more paralyzed. There's a lot of theories as to why, but one of the main theories is actually that because sanitation had improved, because conditions had improved, children didn't have an immunity to the disease. So when they were, they didn't develop it as young children in a weak form. So when they were exposed to it as young adults, they got the disease. Unfortunately, that was the exact opposite of what was suspected at the time. And at the time, especially in the New York City outbreak, you had attempts to to clean up the tenements, to quarantine the tenements, to close schools, close pools, close any place where there would be public contact, especially with poorer people. But polio wasn't a disease that discriminated economically. And it's so important for the case of polio that you had a figure like Franklin Roosevelt, who was well-known and also seen as a patrician from a great name, and yet he contracted this disease that was thought to be just among the immigrant population. Here's what a journal article says about it. A disease originally considered mildly contagious, now regarded as very contagious. For an endemic disease, it had tended to become epidemic. For an apparently rare clinical condition occurring only sporadically in small outbreaks, polio had, by the 1940s and 1950s, emerged as an epidemic disease of global proportions. At its height, from 1950 to 1954, polio resulted in the paralysis of some 22,000 U.S. citizens each year, equivalent to an average rate of 14 per 100,000. Many thousands were left permanently disabled by the disease. And in the case of polio, there's little doubt, because it's a disease that was arrested in mid-epidemic stretch that it's the result of the development and mass administration of an inactivated polio virus vaccine. In 1948, Thomas Weller and Frederick Robbins successfully grow polio virus in live cells. Six years later, they get the Nobel Peace Prize. Jonas Salk develops the first vaccine against polio, injectable, inactivated polio vaccine, while Dr. Albert Sabin develops a live oral vaccine. 
rapidly becomes the vaccine of choice. In 1955, the Congress passes a Polio Vaccination Assistance Act. It allows Congress to appropriate funds to the Communicable Disease Center. By the 1970s, circulation of wild polio had all but ceased in the United States. In 1979, there's a case of an Amish person who, for religious reasons, did not get vaccinated, and that is the last known polio case in the United States. It's still a disease that uh, ravages worldwide. But while we're treating polio, some other things come up. So in 1964, there's a rubella epidemic in the United States. Twelve million cases, scores of thousands of infants affected and thousands of deaths. 1962, President Kennedy signs the Vaccine Assistance Act into law, allows the CDC to support mass immunization and initiate maintenance programs. Measles vaccine comes in 1963. 1977, you had the first pneumococcal vaccine. It's not true to say that there's never any criticism of what's going on, uh, although generally there's momentum and encouragement for vaccines in, in, in 20th century history. But you do start to have some voices, particularly late 60s, 1970s, when, when everything was being looked at, all institutions were being looked at. And you have people like Ivan Illich, who are talking about the concept of medicalization. In other words, the application of medicine to things that normally wouldn't be considered in the zone of medicine and thereby allowing the government in. This is particularly aimed at the treatment of mental illness and the classification of people in mental illness, particularly the institutionalization of people. But... You know, and, and, and Illich and others would say that social and cultural problems are being turned into medical ones. Here's one of the points that he makes about vaccines. Tuberculosis, for instance, reached a peak over two generations. In New York in 1812, the death rate was estimated to be higher than 700 per 10,000. By 1882, when the bacteria had not even been isolated against, it had already declined to 370 per 10,000. The rate was down to 180 when the first sanatorium was opened in 1910. After World War I, but before antibiotics became routine, it had slipped into 11th place with a rate of 48. Cholera, dysentery, typhoid similarly peaked and dwindled outside the physician's control. By the time their etiology was understood and their therapy had become specific, these diseases had lost much of their virulence 90% of the decline of mortality from scarlet fever, diphtheria, whooping cough, and measles had occurred before the induction, introduction of antibiotics and widespread immunization. In part, this recession may be attributed to improved housing and a decrease in the virulence of microorganisms. But by far, the most important factor was a higher host resistance due to better nutrition. In poor countries today, diarrhea and upper respiratory tract infections occur more frequently, last longer, and lead to higher mortality rates where nutrition was poor, no matter how much or how little medical care is available. The criticisms of, of these voices are that look at the, the, that the decline in cases is not matching with the intervention of doctors. Here's where I like uh, Michel Foucault's take on this, and there's a whole cult of personality surrounding him as a medical professor, a philosopher. Here I just like his own insights in this very specific topic, and not to get into his entire theories. The applicable character of vaccination and virilization made it possible to think of the phenomena in terms of the calculus and probabilities. To an extent, we can say they benefited from mathematical support that was at the same time a sort of agent of their integration within the currently acceptable fields of rationality. Again, we go back to that experience alone proved its veracity. But something else 
Here the apparatus that appears with varialization is not the division between those who are sick and those who are not. It takes all who are sick and who are not as a whole, that is to say, the population, and it identifies the coefficient of probability morbidity or probable mortality in this population, that is to say, the normal expectation in the population of being affected by the disease and death linked to the disease. So you get rate of disease in the population. This concept of cases, Foucault says, that comes up in the 1700s. Then you start breaking up the population into groups and seeing how many cases there are. Children under three seem to get more smallpox than normal. Certain regions of France seem to get more smallpox than normal. Then you say, how do we prevent it? A simple way of what Foucault is talking about here is that with vaccines, medicine enters the governmental sphere. It's not just an individual being treated by a physician, but a government making decisions about populations, how to improve health in the populations, and setting up mechanisms to do so. Here's what uh, one vaccine critic, Susan Downing, uh, writes on her website. Not too long ago, lethal infections were feared in the Western world. Since that time, many countries have undergone a transformation from disease cesspools to much safer, healthier habitats. Starting in the mid-1800s, there was a steady drop in deaths from all infectious diseases, decreasing to relatively minor levels in the early 1900s. Today, we are told that medical interventions increased our lifespan and single-handedly prevented masses of deaths. But is it really true? After my experience in the hospital system, it is clear that the issue is not settled long ago and laid to rest, as most of the medical profession says it is. This above exemplifies one of the many potential consequences we face as a result of vaccination for measles and the other childhood incidents, illnesses such as rubella. In the 1920s and 30s, she writes, doctors were often quite relaxed over diseases which today are presented as more deadly than the plague. Many grandparents today are completely bemused at the way the medical provision describes infections, which were to most of them straightforward holidays off school. The medical system now considers measles more dangerous than the plague, the most dangerous disease known to man. The issue of vaccines has come up recently. Is there many states that allow parents exemption? And it is an issue where we cannot, if it will, at least if the theories to believe stay out of each other's business, because if a percentage of infants are not vaccinated in an area, it may affect the remaining population or those who are unable to take vaccines and increase the chance of outbreak. There's a recent measles outbreak occurring in Disneyland. I guess my best take on it is that I would encourage vaccination. I think the history of some of the diseases, you can make an argument that there, there was a decline due to better nutrition or cleanliness. I think there was still a risk in those cases and that for the individual, the risk of that disease seems stronger than the risk of any harm from a, from a vaccine. I also believe that, uh, the examples of smallpox and polio don't work as well as those diseases where simple nutrition or improvements in cleanliness didn't help. And indeed, in the case of polio, there might have been an effect where the cleanliness and improvement in infant health might have actually furthered the spread of disease due to the lack of immunity. I think, though, that these are all interesting questions. One is that this is a kind of individual rights issue that doesn't, like so many of them, and different if we were talking about income tax or talking about guns, it doesn't, like so many of them, just separate between left-wing and right-wing politics or Republicans and Democrats. And this is a, an area where you have some strong individuals, you know, we might say the anti-vaccine movement, who otherwise on political issues might be far to the left, or in some cases right, and people of both parties encouraging parents to vaccinate children, red states and blue states, with policies that support vaccines. 
So suspicions of this aren't new. And I'm one who would lean towards the pro-vaccine side in all of this. And I don't think, though, that you can completely discard a healthy skepticism of the medical community in some cases, of, a, of particularly of an establishment. And some of the warnings of, of say, your Illiches or your Foucault's about how medical practice can turn into government practice, can turn into government establishment, and sort of stop people from thinking because you've got the banner of the medical establishment behind it. You can disagree with your opponent and see in what they're saying still a useful thing that perhaps in the extreme might be useful. For example, while I think your general childhood vaccinations seem to me to be worthy, I wouldn't like to see something new introduced, some new form of medicine, and then sort of on that accepted practice of vaccination, it's instituted when its effects aren't really well known. So I think on the basis of real evidence, it's totally fine uh, that we continue to question newly established, say, medicine that the state or federal government is ordering you to take. This is a issue where history can be supremely of help. It's probably the issue because you're talking about diseases that we talked about here that have been largely eliminated so the threat doesn't exist today. And you need the historical tool to really understand what it was like. It's relevant that it affected a major figure of the 20th century, although oddly, in a perhaps helpful way. Roosevelt dies in 1945. He does not live to see Salk develop and test the first successful polio vaccine in 1955, and to start to stay the progress of the disease. When Roosevelt dies, the disease that he's afflicted with is still a large killer and still will be for 15 more years, at least. Okay, so that was 2014, before COVID or anything like that. Uh, I think it holds up well. I think there's some important points in that podcast one thing, in, in case I misunderstood, because we talked about some new type of medicine, and it's okay to say no um, to some new type of medicine. I'm not talking about vaccines. I was talking about just using that example for anything, like let's say drug implants, mandatory or something like that. You know, we have a right as Americans to, to examine even medical knowledge. The vaccines are not questionable, and the uh, everyone should take it. Everyone should get their COVID vaccine. It's the only thing, I think, that's going to get us out of this. I don't believe that there'll be a treatment. I'm not a physician. This isn't my history can beat up your medicine. So anything like that, you have to consult other sources for that. So there's increasing scholarship that maybe FDR didn't have polio at all, that he might have had Guillain-Barre disease. It was a disease that was not well known by American physicians. And we don't believe Roosevelt's doctors were even aware of the disease. It was something diagnosed more in Europe. It's an auto, autoimmune disease. And that some of his symptoms are close. There's the first article on this comes out in 2003. There's even a, um, there's also arguments that indeed it was. You know, Roosevelt had attended a Boy Scout event and there was a lot of that influenced the diagnosis heavily. That, oh, now we, you know, that that event may have influenced the diagnosis of polio. That's how he caught it. Um, a 2003 peer-reviewed study of Roosevelt's paralytic illness, pattern recognition, reconstructing the pathogenesis, and Bayesian analysis favored a diagnosis of Guillain-Barre over polio. There was recently an article in the Journal of Medical Biography said that his age and his many features of the illness are more consistent with a diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. You know, but to a certain extent, I like Jonathan Alter's take on this was, it really doesn't matter because neither disease was treatable at the time. And there's others who say that he did indeed have polio. I can't really make the determination. I don't have enough knowledge or information, but I want you to at least be aware that this is a little controversy. We keep talking about FDR and polio. 
Um, there's a little controversy around that. And I guess the point is, it doesn't matter if it's a misdiagnosis, as we said on the podcast, it's the greatest misdiagnosis of the 20th century and led to a helpful result. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you like the program, please tell someone about it. Post a review on iTunes. Rate us on iTunes. Favorite us on Stitcher. Comment on Stitcher. Comment on your blog. This is how people will find the program. We have a Facebook site where I've done something I haven't done in a while in that I've posted some of the books that I really have enjoyed reading uh, over the years of doing this onto the Facebook site. Fans of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics Facebook site. So go ahead and like that one and join. And thanks for listening.